Um, thank you so much, Congressman. I mean, you joked about the free lunch. It is actually a great speaker who not only we invite back, but we can attract a full house without bribing people with salmon. So this is a great tribute to you. But really, the substance of your remarks that you are able to draw on the history of the conflicts and the various issues that came and went from Reagan, Carter to, to today, it's a wonderful perspective to have and to have you getting to win-win in your vision. Uh, there are so many things which could be raised. I, w I was very glad that you had up front the issue of the services agreement where our Brad Jensen has done some really interesting work and, and that seems to be by implication going forward with Congress without any pushback, which is wonderful news because it makes great sense for the U.S. What I would like to start with, though, is where you ended with TPA and your call for greater consultation with Congress between at the negotiators to the individual members and so on. As you're probably aware, people are a little bit cynical about Congress at the moment. And there is this idea that perhaps President Obama, for example, when he tried to consult that didn't really produce bipartisan results. It just produced stagnation. So in your view, I understand from your principles and your goals why you want Congress involved, but as a practical matter, is there any reason we should be hopeful to getting Congress involved more deeply and more detailed in these things isn't just a way to stop all trade activity? I think it's really the opposite. I think the lack of consultation only increases conflict. And when conflict is increased, there's a hesitation to act. And I think that's very true of a divided Congress with a Democratic president. And so it's not only substantively important but I think it's procedurally absolutely necessary. Uh, there isn't enough attention to trade issues in Congress today. And if we don't remedy that by having a broadly based consultation process, what I think is going to happen is that people are going to make decisions, choose up sides, somewhat automatically. And I tried to paint in the speech that these different views about domestic economic issues, these different views can readily seep into how you approach international issues because in terms of perspective, there is some relationship. The only way in trade to try to move forward is to put these issues on the table and to discuss them in a very vigorous way. Uh, for example, um, on a bipartisan basis, we have introduced GSP legislation. Uh, there needs to be some real discussion within the Congress about that. Um, and that's, I think, true across the board. I just want to emphasize this. If we simply say uh, that uh, the Trade Promotion Authority is needed without discussing its substance, I think you're likely to have more conflict and probably more hesitation within the administration to push it. Very different than fiscal. Wait a second, Gary. I've got a couple more, I'm afraid, since the congressman was kind enough to give us time. And also, generally, we take outside questions first after I'm done. Um, moving on to TTIP, where you, in contrast to a lot of your remarks about TPP, you pushed a very seemingly buoyant view, talking about the special relationship with Europe, not in those terms, but and that it could go forward very quickly. And obviously, a deal with other rich countries uh, is a nice thing. But just two questions following up on that. First is, there are a number of us, including I think some people in Congress, who view Germany as actually the most manipulative, most mercantilist 
major economy in the game, that they have had enormous unfair trade advantages by shackling their currency down, that they do not permit trade and services. Why is your tone so ignoring of that, 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 that Germany gets off scot-free in this kind of context? Well, I don't want to be too buoyant. Um, because in trade negotiations, we invariably set targets that won't be met. Um, and I'm not sure why we do that. Um, and there are some difficult issues with Europe. Um, I think, for example, the, some of the intellectual property issues, um, the, genet the genetically modified issues are serious issues. So I, I tried to, to strike a note of some balance. I think the relationships are so close that they help us as long as they don't blind us to the problems ahead. But also, I think there's going to have to be sensitivity. I think some of what Europe does is strictly to safeguard their present uh, processes. And where, where it really is nothing but an artificial tri trade barrier, I think we have to work hard to, uh, to tell them no. But where there is some basis, I think we're going to have to have a thorough discussion. If I might say so, I think the discussion within Europe over uh, cultural, um, intellectual property is something that will continue to be discussed within Europe. I'm glad they're proceeding, but it will be discussed within Europe, and I think we in the U.S. need to have some sensitivity as to the, as, as to the dynamics of that. To be fair, uh, there are a lot of Europeans who look askance at the U.S., a U.S. that hasn't signed on to ILO conventions, a U.S. whose environmental standards are much lower. Kim Elliott of our sister um, think tank, the CGD, has worked on this. I mean, do you have any hope, maybe you're not allowed to say this because it would scuttle things, but do you have any hope just as, say, Japan wants to reform itself by trade policy that we could raise labor or environmental standards in the U.S. by engaging with Europe? Or is, are we the lowest common denominator in that agreement? Now, we haven't signed many of the conventions, but we have been party to the ILO declaration. And I think the fact is that when it comes to the effort to develop basic international standards, it's the U.S. that has been in the lead in its implementation. The, the, as I discussed in the speech, for a number of years after the battles with uh, Japan, and their closed markets that so dominated our discussions in much of the 80s into the 90s, what became for U.S. trade policy the center stage was the issue of core labor standards and environmental standards. Much We pioneered in that much more than Europe in, in their trade agreements. Mm -hmm. For example, the action plan vis-a-vis -vis Colombia was worked out between the administration and some of us in Congress and the Colombian government. It wasn't done between Europe and Colombia or Canada in Colombia. So I think there will be discussion in, in, uh, with, with uh, Europe, and it will surely be true in terms of, of um, TPP, of basic uh, standards of, of international of labor standards and environmental standards. Cool. Turning to TPP, you've, you've put out and we've distributed your proposal specifically on U.S.-Japan automotive trade, as well as a copy of your remarks, and that's available to everybody, as well as will be on the website. Let me, I, I promise not to dominate the discussion much further, but it's only been 10 minutes, so let's, let's enjoy. Um, let me pose a couple more questions to you to draw you out since you've been brave and forthright enough to make these proposals. You have this great list 
in your speech of all the positive benefits to U.S. as well as the globe from TPP, Malaysian auto duties, credit cards, agriculture, pharmaceuticals. But you do obviously feel that there is a very major issue in the Japanese auto industry. So let me pose a couple questions about that. First is, at the moment, even though the U.S. isn't, U.S., or I shouldn't say the U.S. country, the Detroit Three are not selling basically any cars into Japan, uh, European automakers are selling cars in Japan. In a very limited way. Same, same percentage they have in the U.S. market, actually. Okay, um, but it's still very limited, and it's, it, it tends to be focused in different areas. Mm -hmm. It's the higher end. And do they have a totally free access to the, uh, to the Japanese market? I think the answer is they haven't had that. But, but the broader question is in general. I mean, so I don't want to get into the term managed trade because as you rightly point out, that's just a straw man people wave. But the question is if you're judging what's fair trade. Right now, U.S. is actually doing quite well in the Chinese market. Buick, for example, is doing extremely well at the high end. Japanese automakers are doing zero, in the roughly zero, in the Chinese market. Germany is doing well in both Japan and China. I, I guess my question is, isn't it sort of natural that at times different types, you do different products, different industries? It's not like we're going to have a U.S. share in every country that is equal to our share of the world market. Isn't that right? No, you posed the issue very well. You said it's natural. The, the problem with the Japanese auto market is that it has been essentially exclusionary. It, it hasn't been natural. It's, it's been contrived. Mm -hmm. And so, so Japan raises this basic question about one-way and two-way tra trade. Do we really believe in two-way trade, the ability to have two-way trade as a basic principle of international trade? And my whole point is you, you kind of have to face up to this issue. And Japan has very carefully over decades essentially decided they were going to have an export platform in manufacturing. It was in machine tools in the 80s, and we lost in six months or eight months a quarter of our machine tool industry. They had complete openness. When I went to Japan, I carried with me a part, a universal joint. I bought it on Main Street, Royal Oak, Joe's Auto Parts, it just was the closest one. It was a wonderful name, Joe Main Street, for $11.46. That exact same part cost $105 in Japan. We could not export to that market universal joints or mufflers or brakes. Was that, was that the natural result of competition? The answer is, it wasn't. And so I think the reason the, the, the Japan trade issue in the automotive sector is so important is it challenges us to ask ourselves, are we really proponents of having open trade, having two-way trade? Is it important or is it not? And I just want to finish with this. The big three have struggled to succeed. I will acknowledge that the competition from Japan in the 70s and 80s did have some beneficial aspects in terms of competition. I acknowledge that. But there was another aspect to it, and that was it was essentially a loaded deck. Now you have, and this is why the passionate feeling within the domestic industry, they are now on their feet. They want to be able to compete. Japan is the third largest automotive market. 
they have now, they're producing 10 million cars with a 5 million domestic uh, arena. So do we want to say to a key part of the manufacturing base in this country, and the same would be true of other parts of our manufacturing base, are you going to have a chance to compete in the third largest market in the field of your competition that uses a sheltered market for all kinds of advantages in competition. Can I just, and again, I'm sorry if I seem to be pushing you, but that you are, you're, you're a very strong person. You can take it. And the point of this is to force you to say your strongest positions in the best way. And I appreciate that. We all do. So one thing about Japan, but also now Volkswagen and others, and Korea and Kia and Hyundai, is that the vast bulk of cars they sell in the U.S. overwhelmingly are made in the U.S. So can we imagine a world where American trade policymakers, including you, would be satisfied if suddenly we were selling a million cars, say, in Japan, but they were all produced in Japan, not in the U.S.? You know, the same way that Toyota or Honda or Hyundai or Volkswagen comes here. Let, it put, let me put it this way. The answer is we need to be sure as there's reform in Japan, and I think there's some reason for optimism in terms of their closed markets, mm -hmm. that that apply to the large automotive sector. And what works out over time in terms of competition is fine with me as long as the competition is open. And, and I'll finish with this because there may, some of you are economists. I've asked economists to, to, to tell me what have been the advantage of Japan having this sheltered market. I think they're larger than just the number of cars they sell. I think there are adv advantages in terms of for example, R&D. There are other advantages that come from a sheltering of a huge market. And, and I want to throw down the gauntlet very clearly. If we believe in open trade and its benefits, we need to be consistent. But most economists... And we're not, and, we're, and, and, and in terms of Japan, for 40 years, we have failed in part, I guess, as I said, the feeling was if the other side loads the deck, in the end it will somewhat work out and they only hurt themselves. I think the answer is when you have that kind of built-in disadvantages, they don't automatically work out and that the damage in the interval to the side that is, is on the, the short end of it, those disadvantages are substantial. So I put a, f a proposal forth that goes beyond what the administration has proposed. I do so because I want us to face up, and I want the administration to face up, and I think all of us to face up. Do we really want to be sure in our negotiations with TPP in Japan now that it's there, and I'm glad Japan is, are we really going to sit down and say to them, as you have these structural changes, as you open up your markets, as you let truly free enterprise roll and not have it so completely managed, are you going to include one of the key sectors and that's automotive? And for me, the answer has to be yes, and we have to find a formula. That's great. Um just since you threw down the gauntlet for economists, I can, in Fred Bergson style, use that to plug a couple of our studies. Uh, Robert Lawrence and Lawrence Edwards did a book for us we published a couple months ago called Rising Tide, which was about the impact of increasing trade, not just with Japan, but with emerging markets on the U.S. economy. And one of the most striking things they found is that the decline in manufacturing employment in the U.S. was actually matched, not just in the U.K. and other free market countries, but in Germany and Japan, the same shrinkage in manufacturing employment. So one way of interpreting that result is Japan actually did hurt itself. It saved no more manufacturing jobs 
but it taxed its consumers in a way the U.S. did not. But let me turn to, I think, one of the, one of the most important things you're doing right now, which is, if you'll forgive me for saying so, which I think is terrific, you are making this linkage currency and TPA. You, you, are, you are really explicitly moving that agenda forward, and as you know, Fred Bergsten, Joe Gagnon from the Institute have done a lot of work on this. And in particular, I, what I think is great is you, in your proposal, you explicitly talk about this has to be done on a global basis, it has to be done according to IMF criteria, it has to be refer referenced to global imbalances. All this is, I think, things that many of us, we either would support or we would agree if you're going to do it, this is the way to do it. My question is, and this picks up on some of the things you spoke about in your opening remarks, Congressman. My, my question is, right now, if we were to apply the manipulation criteria, it actually wouldn't be Germany or Japan, it would be South Korea and China and Singapore, and arguably, possibly Switzerland, but anyway, South Korea, China, Singapore, that would be the countries that would be the big manipulators. How do you feel it's gonna work? Do you feel that there is room to prevail upon a US administration to call a China a manipulator, a South Korea a manipulator? Or is it just opportunistic, they're not in the TPP negotiations? But what if Ch Korea came in? Do you think Congress could make a, a US administration do that? I'm not sure, so before, now, now your turn. Um, I'm glad you raised currency because it's another example, it relates to the automotive in, uh, issue. We've struggled with the currency issue. Congress has spoken a number of times, so has the administration. My main point is the status quo is unacceptable. We're struggling with a status quo that doesn't work. We have no international mechanism effectively to address currency manipulation. And so I say things somewhat starkly in part to try to be an impetus for us to do better. Now I know there are some people who think that currency manipulation, that that problem will work out in the wash. I, as I say in my speech, I'm skeptical of that view that if markets are manipulated, they'll kind of self-correct. They may over time way off in a future, but the damage during that period can be substantial. So I just want to finish by saying I think it's a tribute to this institute that it has been in the vanguard of raising this issue. You have surprised some people because they think of you in the lingo as free, in quotes, traders. But essentially what Fred and all of you have done is to challenge us to say, is trade really free when there is such deliberate currency manipulation? And my own view is, I think it isn't. And, and I'm not sure of the solution. I think it would be better if we could push IMF. I have suggested at times that the administration that did not want to name China as a manipulator under the statute to file a WTO case because there is language in the WTO that might apply. That hasn't happened. All I'm saying is I don't think we can continue the status quo and that's why I want it raised in TPP and in TTIP and be part of the discussions between in TPA. Now if you get all that right, all those T's, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, go on television. Uh, but, but, but it needs to be raised in all three, mm -hmm. all three T's, to, 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 it's a lousy pun. But we need to tee it up. We, we need to tee up currency so that we just don't keep kind of, just, just kind of bungling along. That really suits us to a T. And um, thank you for your leadership on this issue. So let me open it up. 
Thank you all for your patience. Um, for those of you, there is a microphone right there and in back if you want to stand up, but there's a microphone in front here. If you want to give it to the lady there in the second row, and then we'll just start going through. And Gary, after the first couple, I'll come to you. Hi, Mr. Levin. I'm Mary Berger with Washington Trade Hi, Daily. Mary. Hi. Um, I wanted to go back to... Um, Make sure the mic works. Oh, I wanted to go back to TPA. And you mentioned the May 10th agreement. As you look ahead to the next iteration of TPA, does the May 10th agreement still stand, or do you believe it's out of date? Does it need to be revisited? Now, I think the May 10th agreement um, was a vital breakthrough. By the way, as I said in my speech, with, as you could tell, I think, with, with some deep feeling, I think what's happened, what, what the tragedy of Bangladesh has essentially said that we need to build on a much broader basis some international standards as nations compete. And, and, and it can't simply be you go to the cheapest place, regardless of the consequences. And I'm glad uh, I mentioned the Wall Street Journal editorial. I'm glad to have this debate. It was interesting that some of the most graphic articles about Bangladesh were in the Wall Street Journal. And so my answer to you is, yes, I think uh, May 10th remains very relevant. It's part, as you know, of, of uh, the TPP discussions. There's been a tabling of a proposal. And I think uh, in, in TPA, it will continue to be part of, uh, of our discussions. That's and great. And any eventual uh, action on fast track. Okay, that's terrific. So the lady at the mic, Gary, and then the gentleman here in the second row. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Marie Griesgraber, New Rules for Global Finance. And I wanted to pick up on the uh, currency manipulation and expand it to trade and financial services. Last week, Lael Brainerd said that the USEU, sorry, I can't manage that acronym yet, uh, trade negotiations would not include trade and financial services because regulation of financial uh, issues were being handled well outside of the trade forum. And I'm wondering if this could also be the situation for a TPP. Uh, those of us trying to track it get very little information as to what's going on with regard to trade and financial services. And our concern is that according to some trade agreements that the United States has, some of our regulations of, of Dodd-Frank are contrary to trade agreements. Um, so I would be very interested in your perspective on this. I understand the, the potential disagreement between Europe and the U.S. on financial services. And Leo spoke because there's a concern that different perspectives will lead to the weakening of what we passed in the U.S. Uh, and in, in some respects, Europe has weaker structures than we do in the U.S. By the way, though, that's beginning to change. And Europe, uh, I was just in some discussions this morning on tax reform, and uh, Europe is now beginning to worry about, uh, about erosion, et cetera, of their tax base. So my answer is, I think TPP is somewhat different than TT. IP. Um, I, I don't think we've, we've gotten very far with, uh, with financial services in TPP. So, you know, my feelings about trade, I think each situation can be somewhat different, but there has to be very frank discussion with Europe about this issue. We just don't want the, the discussions to lead to the weakening of our of, our, of what we passed with immense difficulty. Terrific. Uh, Gary Huffbauer, the gentleman in the second row, and then the lady at the mic, and then that guy. Thanks so. very much, uh, Congressman Levin. I have uh, two, uh, two questions, both short. In your um, statement, you did not mention the WTO or Bali. And so my question is, do you write off the prospect of an agreement at Bali, modest, but, but some agreement which uh, 
keeps the WTO alive as a negotiating uh, body. Second question goes to currency. We've had a robust uh, exchange within the Institute, and I won't identify the players, <laughs> but Schott and Huffbauer are amongst them. Some people say that if you introduce currency in a TPA, first of all, it'll be too late because um, Fruman has the train out of the station. The TPP is going to all come together. If you introduce it at this late stage, it'll blow up the TPP. Others say that um, the uh, you know the debate is is there. Everybody's aware of it, and uh, Congress will insist, even if that does slow down the train, that uh, currency uh, there be a currency chapter in the TPP. So now I I know your views on on it, but what I want is a forecast. Which of these two groups within the within the uh, institute will be proven right? Thank you, Gary, for reminding us. I'll be we very brief agree. on that. <laughs> I don't want to get into a battle here. Um, as to bullying the WTO, um, um, no, I don't write it off. Uh, I, I, I went to Doha, it seems, uh, decades and decades ago, and, and uh, there was some hopefulness. I, I think it did not work in part because of the clash between the, the, the more rapidly developing industrial nations and the developed industrial nations. So I think whatever can be, uh, can survive uh, those discussions, uh, I, 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 the better. Currency, look, um, I think the train has to be slow enough to handle all of the major issues. And if it isn't, if it isn't slow enough, um, there will just be immense conflict, including within Congress, that may not be very constructive. So I, I want us to move ahead, but to do it in the right way. I don't want to slow down the train because of currency, but I don't want the charge that slowing down the train means you can't discuss currency at all. I don't agree with that. Great. And I, I think that's rather true on a bipartisan basis. Dave Camp and I spoke rather similarly about uh, that issue at a recent uh, hearing. Thank you. I'm not trying to cut off the congressman. Obviously, it's just so many people who want to speak. The gentleman in the second row, then the person at the mic, then there, then I'll go to Jeff. Sure. Uh, my name is Matt Shul. I'm a reporter from Inside U.S. Trade. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Congressman Levin, uh, two questions about the Japan Action Plan that you announced. First, I think before you said that this plan was going to be done in consultation with stakeholders, and I was just wondering, uh, you know, if you talked to the auto companies and uh, the auto workers union about this and whether they've endorsed this plan. Uh, or not. Secondly, uh, and also I should say, your colleagues, uh, you know, uh, Congressman uh, Camp, whether he's endorsed it or whether you've talked to him about it. Secondly, um, you know, you've, you've laid out a lot of uh, kind of specific ways that the tariff phase out should be uh, tied to uh, increase in, in import share. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, you know, how confident are you that this sort of approach will actually end up in the TPP agreement. You made a comment about how, um, you know, sometimes uh, trade, trade negotiations, you lay out targets that won't be met. And so I was just wondering how likely or confident are you uh, that this will be included in a TPP agreement because, um, you know, you, uh, in the context of the Korea negotiations, laid out some targets there about how the auto issue should be addressed that weren't necessarily reflected in the final agreement done by the Bush administration or the Obama administration. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have talked to the stakeholders, and I think um, I think they're they're all very pleased that this idea has been put forth. Um, in terms of reaction among uh, my colleagues. Um, I think um, we're just beginning to talk about specifics. And my hope is that 
that the, that the, the framework, perhaps not all the details, will be a subject of uh, discussion. What we try to do in there is to have a, have a schedule so there are incentives and disincentives. And so what we say in the proposal is that the more there are allowed exports from here, the more the tariff will go down both the 2.5% and the 25%. And the less they meet, and we use OECD standards or, or facts, the slower. So it's an effort to, to, to build incentives and disincentives. And I think in that respect, it's creative. Whether it would come out in the exact same shape with the exact same schedule, I think is open for discussion. But I th my own judgment, I said this at the beginning, to tie the issue of opening to the Japanese market to, say, shrimp from Brunei or whatever it is, or an agreement between two countries about something other than automotive, I don't think is a satisfactory way to approach it. Okay. Well, I, let me just say a word about Korea, because um, Korea, I was in the center of that effort with the UAW and, uh, and Alan Mulally, and we, we pushed that change from the from the language in, in the Korea agreement negotiated by the Bush administration. I think it was a step forward, an important step forward. I voted for the Korea Free Trade Agreement. I think Japan represents an even more startling challenge to us in terms of two-way and one-way trade. It's much larger, and the history is one much more of rigorous control of their market. The lady at the mic, the gentleman here, then Jeff, I would encourage those of you raising your hands to go stand at one of the mics and get in line. Thank you very much. Mireya Solis uh, from Brookings. Uh, Congressman, thank you so much for your remarks, and I really appreciate the spirit of candid exchange of ideas, and that's uh, what I want to do, and sort of uh, um, address two of the specific issues you raised in your proposal vis-a-vis -vis Japan and the TPP and make the case that perhaps this could actually be not a step forward, but could actually uh, hinder the TPP negotiations and gauge uh, re your reaction to that. The first is on the point of linking the uh, phase out of American tariff to certain foreign import penetration ratio uh, in Japan. And I do think that this does account or uh, it represents managed trade. This is not a new conversation, and I think that a managed trade approach has been dismissed for very sound reasons foremost among them that I don't think it's up to trade officials, trade negotiators to decide what should be the foreign uh, market share in a specific market. So I think that the focus has always been that we should get the trade uh, rules right, that we should have fair access based on rules, and then you let the market decide the outcomes. And I think that should be perhaps the guiding approach and not to decide what should be the specific uh, market share. I doubt that many TPP countries would go along with that approach. I think Sorry, that they can, can you phrase something in the form of a question? Even though you're making a very good statement, can you phrase it in the form of a question to the Congress? All right, so how would you react to the question that this approach could actually hinder the TPP negotiations because countries in the TPP will not accept numerical targets as they go forward? And the second question is on the uh, currency manipulation. I think that the problem is not that the MF has not enforcement, but actually that there's no conceptual clarity as to what types of behavior constitute currency manipulation. There's a wide gray area, quantitative easing and so forth has been very controversial. So my uh, question to you is, do you not fear that by introducing a currency manipulation clause in the TPP without that conceptual clarity, without letting the IMF first set out those guidelines, that this again could produce the demise of the TPP negotiations as they continue to stumble along, lacking that uh, conceptual clarity? Thank okay. you. No, thank you, and, and, and let me try to be as brief as I can, because I've read your, your uh, well-written material and well thought out. In terms of tying, um, tying something to OECD, the problem is this. Nothing else has worked. 
and you can have rules, but so far there's been no ability to, to, to implement the rules. We've tried a number of times. And so what I want to do, I'm not sure that that proposal is, is, is the answer, but we need an answer. And all those, for example, just another way to do it is to say 25 years. The problem with that is, um, will anything happen within the 25 years? So I propose it because I want to challenge you and others who've given thought as to number one, does it really matter? And number two, if it matters, how we assure that there'll be a change. So I want to throw the ball back to you. And then on currency, and I read your, your, your article, uh, recent article, I think IMF is further along than some think in terms of setting up some parameters. And again, I, I want to throw down the challenge. That's the purpose of what I'm saying to everybody. Do you think currency manipulation matters? Yes or no? Or do you think you just let it happen and it will work out? And if it matters, how do you handle it? And uh, silence is not an answer to something that matters. So I want to throw that, I read your material, and as I read it, I want to throw back to you, give me an alternative. Tell me what you would do that's likely to have a result. I would just point out, and I'm sure the congressman has read these materials as well, that Joe Gagnon from our institute has been in very active dialogue with the IMF in terms of defining operational measures of currency manipulation and estimating their impact on jobs. And again, there's reason to debate it, but for those of you who want to get into it, we had an event here about two months ago where there was an active discussion between the IMF and Joe's presentations, and on our blog there's ongoing discussion of how you could make this implemented. Doesn't mean that we all agree on it, but it does mean there is some specific Right, if raising it in, in the transatlantic and TPP, raising it pushes us to have some international structure, that'd be excellent. We have the gentleman here, and then we have Jeff Schott and the gentleman at the mic. And again, I encourage those of you who want to speak to get in line at one of the mics. Thank you very much, Raymond Barrett with Par Global. A question on Chinese SOEs. Uh, some in Congress have uh, called for the Commerce Department to study whether the existing laws provide the right remedies against anti-competitive practices by Chinese SOEs. I'm wondering if you think the existing laws are adequate, or do you support uh, maybe more active US uh, policies like, say, funding XM Bank more to, to counteract that? No, I, I think there's reason to be concerned, and I would be supportive of such efforts. It's very controversial. My role in China PNTR was, to say the least, uh, controversial. It was going into to the WTO anyway, and we set some, I thought we should set some provisions into uh, the accession vote, and we did that. The trouble was the Bush administration failed to implement the annual review that we particularly placed in there in lieu of every four years and as I mentioned, the 421. So there was a failure of, of, of activism in enforcing uh, China's obligations. The, the, there isn't a regimen that totally answers this problem. And, and I acknowledge that. It wasn't a trade agreement with China. I, and the WTO covers it to some extent. So I favor more active use of the WTO mechanism and more active uh, efforts like uh, XM. Great. Uh, Jeff, do uh, you want to give him the mic and then the gentleman at the standing at the mic? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Schott with the Peterson Institute. Uh, I'd like to turn to the uh, proposal, specific proposal you put forward. Uh, I won't comment on the tariff part because I think 
over the 25-year horizon that you have for action that uh, things will be overtaken by events. There will, the EU-Japan free trade agreement will force some further opening of the Japanese market. The Korea-Japan agreement will probably evolve. There may even be something in the WTO that leads to MFN liberalization of the Japanese market, including non-tariff barriers, in that 25-year horizon. That's perhaps being optimistic. I hope not. Uh, but the question on exchange rate rules, uh, it, it, this discussion has been very informative. Uh, and let's assume, uh, as you say, that if the U.S. puts forward a proposal on exchange rate uh, uh, misalignment, manipulation, that it just slows down the train of the TPP. And the talks are extended at least another year because this couldn't happen until late this year. Countries would want to review it, discuss it. Uh, they would see it as another big U.S. demand in the rulemaking area on top of new ru additional rules on labor, environment, uh, state disciplines on subsidies to state-owned enterprises and the, and the like. Are, are you concerned that if a general rule was, dis was put forward in the TPP, it would lead other countries to scale back what they are willing to do in other areas where we want uh, additional obligations? Uh, or is your real concern to, have so to target Japan? Uh, in this case, to set a precedent in the Asia-Pacific context. And then would you want to instead put that in the bilateral agreement that the United States is negotiating in parallel with Japan uh, before the end of the TPP? That, of course, would also slow down the process, but either way you're talking about an extension of the TPP negotiations for a year or two at the, at, at, at the, uh, at the quickest. <laughs> Well, you know, when, when we began to talk about currency and TPP, they said, well, that's rules making. I mean, that's what trade is. So I, I didn't find that uh, particularly dispositive. Um, look, I, I don't want to slow down TPP. That's not the purpose of raising currency. It's, look, I, I've been here a number of times. And, and when we gather, we don't always agree. I think we agree we need to dig into these issues as a prelude to moving ahead. And I think we need to, to confront the currency issue. And it may well be that there could be some success in bilateral discussions. But I just don't want to shunt it aside, either because we say it doesn't matter because I think it does, or because it's too complicated. Okay, the gentleman at the the two gentlemen in order at the mic, but first, hey, uh, Roger Murray with the Alliance for Fair Trade with India. I wanted to follow up on the letter you sent. Sorry, that I'm worried that mic seems to be out. I don't know. I apologize for that. I'm just too tall. Here we are. I don't apologize for that. <laughs> so, uh, Roger Murray with the Alliance for Fair Trade with India. I wanted to follow up on the letter you sent with a number of your colleagues last month ahead of the uh, U.S.-India strategic dialogue, you listed a number of uh, detailed concerns with uh, protectionism uh, coming from India, particularly with intellectual property, forced localization. Uh, curious if, um, uh, on following up on the dialogue now complete, um, if you're working on any follow-up uh, measures uh, to keep this. Be louder. Uh, if, if you're I'm curious if you're working on any follow-up measures to that letter and to the strategic dialogue on these issues. Thank you. We did hear that. So ba you. Basically, you know, we want Congress involved in trade negotiations, but we have a trade negotiator. And I think the responsibility in terms of follow-up is now mainly with the uh, USTR. Uh, and, and I have some faith that they will do that. I mean, if you, we don't have enough time, but my view about compulsory licensing, I think, has been a balanced one. I think we have to understand that this was involved when we negotiated the, the PRU FTA. Um, I insisted that we change what was negotiated by the Bush administration to have a better balance in terms of uh, safeguarding the 
the rights of those who, who created the patent and access to medicines by those in Peru in that case. We found a balance that was somewhat controversial. I think a good one. I continue that pattern. I think we have to understand the needs within a developing nation. But we also have to make sure that they, as they meet those needs, do not discriminate. Uh, in, that, in this case, I think that was what was happening. And so I, th I have faith that the USTR will follow, but we'll be pressing them. Time for another plug before we go to what will probably be the last question. Uh, the Institute has underway, under the leadership of Fred and Arvind Subramanian, a major project on U.S.-India economic integration. Some very interesting work on these issues, and we'll be releasing a preview of some of that in September when the um, Indian Prime Minister comes to visit. Please. Um, no, thank you, Congressman. Uh, my name is Toshinori Doi. I'm from the Japanese Embassy, and I have a question on uh, currency issues. Uh, in your initial remarks, uh, Congressman, you characterized the Japanese currency policy as a uh, currency manipulation. Uh, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, when he made a testimony at the House Financial Services Committee last week, he also uh, made some remarks on the Japanese currency issues. Uh, when he was asked by a Congressman on uh, Chinese currency policy and Japanese currency policy, uh, he made the following remarks. I will just quote. Uh, there are some fundamental differences between China's policy and Japan's policy. China has managed its exchange rate and kept it for many years below its equilibrium level in order to increase its exports. That's what economists call a zero-sum game. What's a game we lose, basically. The Japanese approach is different. They are not manipulating the exchange rate. They are not directly trying to set the exchange rate at a given level. What they're doing, what they're doing is engaging on strong domestic monetary policy measures, trying to break the deflation that they've had for about 15 years. And a side effect of that is that the yen has weakened. The G20 and the G7 have discussed these matters, and the international consensus is that as long as a country is using domestic policy tools for domestic purposes, that would be an acceptable approach. So in a sense, I guess, uh, Bernanke, um, Chairman Bernanke is uh, saying that there's an international consensus uh, that the Japanese uh, economic policy, the currency policy, is acceptable and appropriate. Uh, could you please comment on that? Yes, I'm, I'm glad you raised it. Um, as I read for the last time my remarks on, on Japan and currency, I, um, I, I changed them a bit. Uh, because I was talking about problems of the future, not the present. Uh, I say with some, with, with total humility, I agree with the Federal Reserve Chair. Um, I think China and Japan are different. I think China's record on direct intervention in the market, in, I think that's clear. And, and going back to what Maya said and others, I think we've been hamstrung in reacting to currency problems, partly from those who think it doesn't matter, and partly because for those of us who do, there has been no institutional framework to act. And so it's been placed on the Secretary of the Treasury to, to, to make the decision. And as hard as we push, that hasn't happened. I think China, clearly was manipulating their currency for a number of years with serious consequences, not only for the U.S., but for other countries. Many countries besides the U.S. objected to Chinese practices. With Japan, I think now the evidence is that they are trying a, a monetary change that hopefully will work and I don't think involves direct intervention in the currency markets. I do think we should discuss this with, with the, the Japanese, with your government in TPP and more broadly because of the history of Japan's utilization of currency manipulation. Because I think many years ago that was also clear. 
And I, I, I mention it because I think we need to be prepared. And at this moment, we're not. So I basically agree with, uh, I think, what the Federal Reserve Chairman said. With much more knowledge than I have, I would very much agree with. But that doesn't mean that we should not raise these issues in to finish TTP, TTIP, and TPA. Fabulous. Well, Congressman, as you said yourself several times, your goal was to get the people on this side of the street, not meaning us Brookings, but meaning the think tank row rather than the hill, to engage and to take up your challenges. And also the hill, though. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. We, we know you want your role. No question <laughs> about that. But we're hoping that you all will continue to have two-way trade with us in terms of ideas and content. And the way you came here and so generously gave of your time and your insights and engaged was a model that I hope you can get some of your other less enlightened colleagues to join us, but it's our honor to have had you back here again today. Can I finish and thank you, the Institute, but thank all of you for coming. We have very much an open door. Uh, my purpose in, in part today was to try to spark more discussion of this and lay down some thoughts as to where we go from here, trying to build in the past and the present because I think there's been a, a failure to fully understand what has made trade policy tick in recent decades. And as someone who participated, I've been proud to be a small part of the process. I think with difficulty, we at times have moved trade policy ahead. And I, as I said, uh, I think recent events, these negotiations, Plus, what's happened in Bangladesh, when you put it all together, essentially means that we need to really have, at this moment, some hard discussion about trade, because globalization is rapidly changing the circumstances in which trade occurs. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all for joining us. The webcast of and transcript of today's discussion will be up later on our website so you'll be able to read all the great exchanges we had. The congressman's proposal and his remarks are up as well as a number of related publications and analyses by our institute. So please, those of you who are not in the room but also in the room, take advantage of that. And please join me in thanking Congressman Levin. Thank you.